This is where we are, but not where we will stay. These are our Sundays, our Wednesdays, our everydays. This is our passion, our heartbeat, our song. We don't have any members because we are family. Whether for the first time or the hundredth time, the good times and even the bad. This place has been good, but now we go to better. We go to a sanctuary, a place of rest and refuge, a place we can call home, a home for our God, a home for us all. Let's go together. journey has begun. Come with us. Kingdom Cathedral, a new home for New Life Covenant Church. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I know you can do better than that. Hallelujah. We are back in the house of the Lord. We are back in the house of the Lord. The Bible says, so clap your hands and shout unto the Lord. What can I say to you, Papa? All I want to say is thank you, Lord. What can I say to you, Daddy? All I want to say is thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All I want to say is thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Is thank you, Lord. Hey, what can I say to you, Daddy? You say, All I want to say is thank you, Lord. Hey, what can I say to you, Papa? You say, All I want to say is thank hey. you, Lord. <laughs> what can I say to you, Daddy? You say,
He's a good God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have every reason to thank Him. We have every reason to thank Him and to glorify His name. He's been so faithful. He's been so kind. He's a great God. He's a great God. Imela. Imela. Okaka. Let's go to the book of John, chapter number 3, verse 1. I'll also be reading Genesis 27, verse 1. And I'll also be reading 1 Samuel, chapter number 3, and verse number 1. The message is entitled, Consequences of Not Seeing. Consequences of Not Seeing. There was a man of the Pharisees that had uh, a ruler of the Jews named Nicodemus came to Jesus at night saying, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. Jesus said to him, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Thus, seeing the kingdom. Message is entitled, Consequences Not Seeing. Let's go to two key scriptures. Genesis 27 verse 1. This is Isaac. 
It came to pass that when Isaac was old, his eyes were dim, so he could not see. He called Esau, his eldest son, and said to him, My son, and he said, Here I am. And uh, he then tells him, I am now going to pass the blessing on your life. And uh, we'll pick up the story later on, how Rebekah puts Jacob in Esau's place. Second Samuel 3 and verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was very precious in those days, and there was no open vision. And it came to pass that when Eli was laid down in his place, his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And so there are all kinds of things that take place as a consequence of both men not seeing. The table of contents here is firstly, in terms of seeing, every person in the room has an automatic blind spot. You have a blind spot. And uh, especially when you get into a four-way intersection, uh, I appreciate uh, traffic in South Africa where there's a four-way intersection. People actually stop and observe that. In Zimbabwe, we have a long way to go to observing traffic laws. I still see individuals going through uh, traffic lights when the traffic light is red and green for opposite traffic. But again, sometimes you can be uh, in entering an intersection when it's green for you, and on your blind spot you might not see a truck coming that is unable to stop for whatever reason. And uh, that's why you always need a person or persons to help you if, if you are entering a blind spot. This is true in the physical, but it's also true as a leader because as leader, we come sensitized emotionally and physically to individuals, and we tend to ignore their incompetence or their uh, disloyalty, uh, and, and we, we tolerate individuals who are totally incompetent because we feel sorry for them for whatever reason, and they are in a blind spot. And that's why when you have... Uh, in our case, uh, our board, which has done very, very well, we try to encourage open and candid conversation where we have individuals that are strong with opposing views, where we are dealing with issues without attacking personalities, because this helps us become better. And sometimes we can have this romantic idea, uh, and we, we can create challenges for ourselves in the future but when you have somebody that's not in your blind spot that can alert you to pending danger or inevitable uh, bad consequence because they are brave enough and loving enough to deal with those issues. This is true of parents raising children. Uh, bend the tree while it's, it's young so that you don't have to cut down branches in the future. Being able to, not being able to see is sometimes uh, as a result of a lack of focus. Sometimes a person can lose focus. Uh, we'll be taking uh, cognizance of focusing uh, in the future. There are causes of blindness where you'll have individuals that have had to live with one eye. Uh, maybe as a result of an accident. We'll see this in chapter number 10 of 1 Samuel, where the Philistines required all of Israel, to, the men, to give their right eye. The table of blindness sometimes where you get older and your eyes begin to dim. I was having a chat with Dr. Danzo and asking him, you know, about him performing surgeries. And one of the things he said he's blessed with is good eyesight. And uh, the sometimes the older you get, you need to get glasses to help you, especially for reading, because your hands are not long enough. And uh, the font is not big enough. And there are times when we have partial blindness, as a man who said he saw men as trees walking. 
And so we can see, but we don't see clearly. And then number five, there's total blindness, where individuals are totally blind. In the case of Stevie Wonder and the case of Ray Charles, one was born blind, the other one, through sickness, became blind. Causes of blindness, number one is darkness. When it starts getting dark, you can't see. And your eyes generally uh, adjust, the retina uh, adjusts where you can sometimes even see in the dark. Causes of blindness, weather, it could be rain, fog, mist, a blizzard, or even uh, the effects of dusk. Number three, cause of blindness, eye injuries, and there's many. Cause of blindness, bright light. Uh, there's a light that I'm hoping that the police would ban. It's these new fluorescent lights that you see, especially on trucks and combis, and uh, they are so blinding, so blinding. They're so dangerous, uh, and it's, uh, in my view, irresponsible for somebody to putting those on because they cause many accidents. Causes of blindness uh, can be cataracts. Uh, sometimes these are natural, and they can be removed early. Sometimes uh, without uh, those being removed, they can cause blindness. And then there's molecular degeneration. There's glaucoma where the optic nerve is severed. And uh, diabetic ret retinopathy which is basically a sickness that affects the retina and the optic nerve. Robella, which is generally called German measles, uh, and myopia. So let's deal about seeing. Let's talk about seeing. Seeing. How does a person see? How do you see? So seeing and knowing what you see. And so there are times when you are seeing something and you know what you see. Seeing and knowing what you are seeing. It's amazing how uh, in one vehicle, when you have somebody producing a report of an accident, and you have four or five people in the vehicle, and they give a report to the police as to what they saw. Everybody saw something on the same event, but they see differently. But seeing and knowing what you are seeing. Number two, seeing, but not knowing what you are seeing. The men on the road to Emmaus saw Jesus but they didn't see it was Jesus. And they had a long conversation with him. He called them fools. And he began to teach them from the law of Moses concerning the things that had taken place in Jerusalem because they were very perturbed. And so number two, you can see, but you don't know what you are seeing. You can see your child, your grandchild, your husband, your wife, your family, you don't, we, we tend not to see the good. We tend to accentuate the bad. Number three, seeing, uh, number three, not seeing, but you don't know that something is there. You can't see, rather, but you sense that something is there. You can't see, but you sense that something is there. Uh, in the sinking of the great Titanic, they had people watching on the bow of the ship and uh, the experienced sailors could smell that there was an iceberg in, the, in proximity of the uh, voyage of the ship and they could smell it was present. But uh, because of the fog, they knew something was there. They couldn't see it, but they knew it was there. And there are times you can, you, you, you can sense something is there, but you can't see. And that's the time to really pray that God would open your eyes. Uh, it's like Nazareth. Only a handful of people sensed that Jesus was the man. 
And then number four, not seeing at all and not even knowing. It's like Gehazi. He's wondering why Elisha is uh, so relaxed. And Elisha prays that the Lord would open his eyes and he sees chariots of fire in the hills. But he was a guy that didn't see and he didn't even know he couldn't see. Even when Naaman came and dipped in the Jordan and Elisha refused to take his gift and Gehazi took the gift privately and, and he became corrupted. But again, he didn't see, but he didn't know he couldn't see. And so there are people who, whose lives are totally destroyed because of not seeing. Uh, put your hand on your eyes and say, open my eyes to see. In chapter number 1, verse 11 of the book of Jeremiah, the Bible says that the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, what do you see? And he said, I see the rod of an almond tree. And the Lord said to him in verse 12, uh, verse number 2, uh, verse 12, he said, you have seen well. You have seen well. But this is my word that I will hasten to perform. And so when Jeremiah was asked, what do you see? He gave the right answer. But he was seeing on one dimension. Yes, he saw an almond rod. Uh, he saw that right, an almond tree. He saw that right. And the Lord said to me, you have seen well. But he says, what you're actually looking at, you're looking at my word that I will hasten to perform. And so if you look at the almond tree, what Jeremiah was actually seeing here, he was seeing Numbers 17 and verse 2. And he didn't even know it. And the Lord said, speak unto the children of Israel for every man to take unto them a rod according to the house of their fathers, of all their princes according to the house of their fathers, 12 rods. And write you on every man's rod the name of the rod. And you shall write Aaron's name on his rod for the rod of Levi. One rod shall be of the head of each house of their fathers. And you shall lay them in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony, a congregation before the testimony, where I will meet with you. And it will come to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose to be leader, that rod shall blossom. And uh, I will make to cease from the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you according to leadership. And Moses told the twelve, the, the tribes of Israel, to do that, and everyone brought their rods, and they marked their rods with their names, including Aaron. And Moses laid them in verse 7 before the house of the tabernacle for a wood, uh, of witness. And the scripture says in verse 18, it came to pass that the next day when Moses went to the tabernacle for witness, behold, the rod of Aaron, the rod of Aaron, of the house, for the house of Levi, budded, brought forth buds, bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. And so, uh, what the almond tree is, it's, it's what is called a uh, deciduous tree, which is a tree that uh, blossoms and produces fruit seasonally. And so, the almond tree is uh, an interesting one because what happens is it produces blossoms and generally they white to pink and they are absolutely beautiful. But from the, the buds, the blossoms break out and then the almonds form within a pod. And then the almond itself, when the pod opens, the almond is within the pod. So what Jeremiah was actually looking at he was actually looking at the fact that God had chosen him as a selected leader in the midst of hundreds of false prophets in Israel who were prophesying that everything was well, that Israel was going to be fine. When Jeremiah was telling the truth that there is coming a, a Babylonian invasion. And uh, I, I'm not against materialism and stuff like that, except that the message of prosperity that began to take shape in the late 80s and 90s of confessing, uh, confessing the word, holding fast the confession of our faith, for he is faithful that promise. What that message then turned to be was blab it and grab it. 
and start confessing things. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. And it is important that we pursue quality of life and we pursue uh, hygiene and high standards of living. We have to do that. And the Lord told the children of Israel several times in Deuteronomy chapter 8, chapter 11. He said, guys, I'm telling you, when you get to the promised land, don't forget me. Don't forget me. Affluence generally ends one's trust and belief in God. And so what happens to King David, he started to forget God, so God afflicted him. And he said, in the day I was afflicted, I turned my life back to God. And so we want you to drive better. We want you to have a flush toilet in your house. I remember growing up as a child, the toilet used to be outside far away. And uh, thank God for a flush toilet. Thank God for a stove that actually works in a house. Thank God for television and internet. And we want you to get better. We want you to get a better car. God bless Wadza. She's been believing God. And she pulled up today with a wonderful bluebird. Makorokoto Wadza. I hope there's a driver's license that goes with that. Because at the roadblock this morning, the policeman asked for my driver's license at 20 past five. And uh, he said, yo, you've been driving from when? I said, yes, from 1977. But that doesn't mean I can drive. Are we together? The fact that you have a license doesn't mean you can drive. The fact that you don't have a license, you could be a good driver, but get a license, what's that? And make sure the car is licensed. And so in the case of Aaron here, God had selected Aaron. And, and in this deciduous tree, the first thing as a sign of his leadership was that his ministry began to bud. And for who you are, where you are, whatever you're doing, you, you will see the buds of success begin to come. It's a small beginning. It's something that is necessary in the evolutionary process of developing a thing. It's something that is necessary. You go from starting to success over a process of time. Sudden success is very dangerous for a human being. That's why when you have teenagers that are sports, uh, become sports icons, and they come into huge money, where you have big money and no character, they become a character and uh, begin to create a, a lifestyle that tends to be beyond or outside of the law. And, and so God, knowing that, starts your life where you start sowing buds. You begin to sprout in certain areas. You begin to see traits and tendencies of areas that you are good in. And then once, once you begin to bud, then the blossoms come out. And being in the area of blossoms, and so when the blossoms come out, you have to welcome bees. And remember that when the bees come, they are there to spread nectar. They are there to make sure that the seed is being formed. They are there to help you, but also remember that the bee also comes with a sting. Not only does it produce honey, which is sweet, but it also comes with a sting. And so in the years now, when you move from budding to blossoming and you start attracting bees, make sure that the bees that you attract are producing honey. God is taking you to a land of milk and honey, not to a land of bee stings. But be aware that the sting is there. If you violate the principles of the kingdom of God, the bee that should be a blessing to bring honey for you will sting you. Some of the sweetest honey comes from uh, a bee category that actually produces the honey inside a tree. You'll find this especially in the Mapani world, where you have this very, very sweet honey. It doesn't actually exist in a cone. It exists within the middle of a tree. But Shamori, that bee, when I was in Mbakwe, when we used to go, uh, whatever hunting we were doing back then, and we'd find that honey, Sometimes you'd find guys after a few days with big impunches on their head because of bee stings, and it seems like the bees would always go for your eyes. And so if you are honey hunting, which is important, remember that the bees that create that also come with the sting. 
Uh, the, the land that God is giving you that flows with milk and honey, with houses you didn't build, it took an individual a lot of effort and strength to build that house that you are getting for free. And they have borne the brunt and the sting of life to build that house that you are getting for free. And you must appreciate the person that built the house for you. They built it for you. And so even though God has removed them, you have to show some sort of appreciation for them. And your children must see you showing that appreciation so that they don't live a life of entitlement. And so he's telling Aaron here, he said your life will blossom. But the stage after blossoming now is the forming of the almond itself. Uh, and the way the almond is harvested once the pod opens and the almond now is exposed, as the pod begins to open, it means that the almond is, has now ripened. And the way to harvest an almond is shaking. The tree is shaking, the same with the olive. And so anything that's worth having in leadership, whether it's olive anointing, olive oil anointing, the shaking comes so the fruit can be given. For you, Aaron, to be the leader and your rods to be recognized, you are going to be shaken. It will start when people become impatient uh, because your brother is in the mountain having long conversations with God and uh, they are going to now persuade you because you are a craftsman, uh, you are a jeweler, and you are going to be uh, put under public pressure to build a golden calf. And because you are such a great craftsman, it looks so great. And you are going to now open the door for the people to honor Horus, the, one of the Egyptian gods, and, and cause people to lose their lives. And the only thing that's going to save you, Aaron, are your, your tribesmen. Because the Levites got up and said, this is, this is abominable. And the Levites then killed, I think it's like 3,000 people for worshiping there. And God honored the tribe of Levi, even though Abraham had paid tithes for him uh, 500 years before. God honored them for that act and that deed. And regardless of the fact that Aaron had, had, had encouraged or was persuaded to uh, build this thing and cause people to sin. God still chose him. And God will choose you. Even though there might be mistakes in your life and there might be people that have uh, changed your mind and assuaged you to think a different way. If you are chosen as an almond rod and God has chosen you to leadership, not only will you have buds, not only will you blossom, but you will have almonds. And you have to then endure the season of shaking. Because once you have been shaken, you will never be shaken again in that same level. It will take another cycle of fruit that comes in your life for another shaking to come. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the Bible says in the end times, whatever can be shaken will be shaken. And I declare in your life that when the shaking comes, you'll see it for what it is. And you'll recognize that this shaking is not to destroy me, but this shaking is to produce a rod in my field that will show a sign of absolute leadership. So much so that when Aaron got up to pray every day, Numbers chapter number 5, 25 and 26, when he prayed, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep his face shine upon you, his countenance be kind towards you, may God give you peace. God said, I will honor his prayer. And that comes because God had made him a prophet in chapter number 7 and verse 1 of Exodus. He said, I have made you, Moses, a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron is going to be your mouthpiece. You don't speak. And for key leaders, if you are a key leader, don't speak. Get somebody to speak on your behalf. Because if you speak, if you speak, there's no recourse. But if somebody is speaking on your behalf, you can always say, my spokesperson didn't read my intention right, or they misrepresented, or something. But if you speak without a spokesperson, there's no recourse. And so Aaron, you are God's spokesman. And because you have done well as a spokesperson, you are going to go, go from being a spokesperson to speak in, 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 in Egypt. 
And then you are going to go as a spokesperson for the people to pray for them. And then you are going to go as a spokesperson to take on the day of atonement the blood of an animal and intercede on behalf of a whole nation and bring health and healing and blessing. And, and so God is saying to Jeremiah, you are in the same category as Aaron. You are looking at an almond branch, but you are not seeing what I'm seeing for you. You are in the highest level of leadership. You are budding. You will blossom. You will bear fruit. Your words will come to pass. People will honor you. The, 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 your name will be mentioned in the Gospels alongside the great prophets of old. And so even though now you are in a dark time, even though you are in a very difficult time, know this, Jeremiah, that you are seeing your life in the metaphor of an almond tree. Oh, whoever you are and wherever you come from, you have to lift up your head and see the things that God is doing and will do in your life. Of course there's bad. Of course there's strategy. Of course there's trial and test. Of course there's a night season. Of course they are devourers. But when you begin to see what God sees in your life, He promised He will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Amen. If you can put your iPad down for a minute and give God a praise offering by clapping your hands. Wherever you are watching around the world, just know that God is causing your rod to bud and He's causing you to increase in many areas. Amen. Give yourself an elbow and say, I see what God is doing in my life. Clap your hands one more time. Calm down, Mark. Amen. I hope you're listening. Take a seat, everybody. In Numbers chapter number 14 and verse 20. There are 12 spies that in 13 and 14 of Numbers go into the same land. All 12. At this point, it's estimated that there are over 2 million of the Jews that have come out of Egypt and the wilderness. And now, in a short distance, uh, number of years, uh, days, they have now come to Kadesh Barnea to cross over into the promised land. And they had spent a couple of years in the wilderness because God was what I what is, uh, was organizing them. They were a people, but they were not magistrized. They, they had to be brought into law and order. Uh, because even though there were cultures and laws based on the various tribes, the 12 of them in Egypt, uh, each family had their own law, custom, and culture. But in terms of law as a whole, there was no law. They were subject to Egyptian law, which was very one-sided. And so the first thing that God does them, he takes them to Mara. Uh, and sweetens their life by taking the bitterness of slavery and the scars of hurt at the waters of Mara. And the sweetening of those waters is to sweeten their heart, their spirit, their attitude, and their life. And, and you can be a person that's been afflicted and, and wounded and hurt maybe 50 years ago even, but, but your heart, inside, right, in, right inside, you are still hurt and grieving from something that happened to you a long time ago. And you cannot go, sisters and brothers, from deliverance out of the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt, crossing the Red Sea. You cannot go to Mount Sinai to get the laws of life without first going to Mara to get the waters of sweetness. And God is now warming them up to order. Because when they get to the waters of Mara, which are sweet, there are 70 palms and 12 springs. Not 13, not 17, not 89 palms. Because they are now being softened into law and order. They are being now, uh, they are being made acquaint, they are being acquainted with how to live orderly lives. Because when the law is coming, there's going to be laws that even include things like sanitation. Be because we, 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 we celebrate, Bazalwani, the mighty deliverance of that many people. But those people are going to the toilet every day. And so now uh, it brings disease and sickness in that hot environment and so on. And so now, uh, if you go from somebody that has lived a life with no law. I remember uh, when I was in Mbakwe, they used to have 
an inspection of your locker. And uh, there was a guy here, uh, I won't mention his name because he lives in Narari. Every night he used to get beaten. Every night. Because his locker was so untidy. Uh, because uh, it was a person of privilege. They had businesses. Uh, my mother-in-law's here. The family shared the same space. They had businesses where mom was in Adbeni. And this man never ever had the occasion ever of polishing his own shoes or fixing his wardrobe. Uh, and, and, and so uh, had many, many challenges. And so then I started helping him, showing him how to fold a shirt, how to fold the trousers, how to roll socks, uh, and so on. And so if you go from a person that has had no law, has had uh, 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 no order, and then you come into a world that's very strict, you'll die at the Mount of Sinai. You'll die. And so God then begins to soften you to get you ready for what's coming. If you want a person that's a person that's not living a disciplined life, and suddenly now you come into big money, ah, you, you'll overturn your Rolls Royce and die. You'll kill yourself. Be, because, and, and, and in Zimbabwe, the problem people in Zimbabwe are people that drive mercs. They, those are the problem people. Because they, they, they think they are more entitled to go over Zwenga, crossing over, crossing traffic lights, uh, uh, as, if, as if the car itself is, is, is making you something better. I, are we together? Yes, are we together? And so my point I'm making here is that uh, you have to go to Mara first. You, you have to bud first. You have to appreciate that, that, that if you lose this bud, you'll never blossom. That you have to look after this bud. Look after that one song. Look after that opportunity to preach, that platform, that place to present in a boardroom, uh, that, that, that chance to go on a business trip that your company is sending you because your manager suddenly got sick or had a, a, a tragedy or catastrophe and couldn't go. But when you go there and you are showing a little bud, don't make like you, even though you were doing uh, the, 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 the general manager's PowerPoints and preparing his speeches, don't go there and and mess up the bud, manage the bud. Because if you can manage the bud, you'll then come to a season in your life where you'll start to blossom. And, and when you start to blossom, people will recognize you because generally with a blossom, you, you may not see it in the lower area a, a certain time of the year, in the middle of the night. You cannot see the tree, but you can smell the fragrance from the blossom. Your blossom will produce a fragrance that will be so infectious. It will draw people, it will draw things to your life. But you must watch the blossom because now forming in that blossom, in that infectious environment that God has brought you in, you are now forming the fruit of life and you will enjoy the fruit of your labor. But remember that, that when you get the fruit of your labor, don't eat all the fruit. Keep some for a seed to plant for the next generation. Oh, Jeremiah, you see right. And, and if you don't see correctly, you are going to destroy your life. And so now in my closing, uh, the Bible says that in Genesis chapter 25 and verse number 23, that the Lord spoke to Rebecca and said, baby girl, the war inside of you are two nations that are fighting inside of you. They are so different. But the younger is going to be more superior to the elder. The elder will serve the younger. And so when the boys were born, the Bible says that uh, the bo Esau came out, he was like a hairy garment. He was just all hair. And uh, then Jacob was born, and the Bible says Esau, in verse 27, became a cunning, a cunning, a cunning hunter. Not a hunter, a cunning hunter. Pastor Godwin, a friend of mine, was telling me years ago, he got a license to shoot a lion in the Monomatapa area near uh, uh, Chirundu. And so him and the trackers, uh, the license was 50,000. And so they were tracking uh, three lions. And after the third day, they realized that they thought they were tracking the lions, but the lions were actually tracking them. That they'd been walking in a circle and the lions over that long grass had been watching them for three days and they didn't even know it. Are you listening to me? 
And so what we're saying here is, is that this man is a cunning hunter. He has great skill. He, he is very stealth. He's a very patient man. Uh, be, 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 be I was watching a documentary on a python uh, that hadn't fed in two years and how it had been tracking uh, a certain herd for a long time. And the python was very patient. It was under the water one time for four and a half days in a water thing, not moving, just the two little things on the top. And, and so this man is a cunning hunter. He has the skill of a python to wait for two and a half years following prey. He's not a rollover. He's not irresponsible. In daughter, I'm a daughter. He's a man of men. Amen. He had more hair on his chest than most people will have on their hair. And, and so Jacob then is a plain man. And the reason he's a plain man is because he's hard to grow up in a man's world as a boy. It's hard to grow in the shadow of somebody that is always there. They're winning the games. They, they're getting the award of the year. They have the trophies. Everybody's clapping their hands. Hey, uh, Esau, he put down an eland. Royal game. He brought an eland, a kudu, an impala. Uh, he doesn't even worry with rabbits anymore. And so Jacob now is trying to find who am I, what am I? And, and his mom takes him and looks after him. And the Bible says here the day came when the time for the blessing was coming that Isaac called Esau. And the Bible says that Isaac's eyes were getting dim. And here we see the consequence of not seeing. God spoke to Rebekah and defined the boys and their future. And Isaac knew what God had spoken to Rebekah. But because he couldn't see now, produced a consequence. And he was about to give the blessing that belonged to Jacob to Esau. And so they had to now MacGyver the whole thing, uh, bring the man's Esau's clothes and kill a goat and cook something and, and put the goats there. I, I don't even understand how hairy this man must have been that his father could mistake goat's hair for him. What kind of an animal is this? And, and so then after the man has, has he's sutilet now, he's eaten and he's satisfied and he burps, he says, comes near my son. And he says, oh, the smell of the earth that the Lord has blessed. And then he feels him and then he begins to speak, regurgitate from inside the cud of the camel, the cud of the cow, from the blessing of Abraham in Genesis 12. This blessing starts coming out of Isaac. And he pours all the blessing on Jacob. All of it. He pours it on Jacob and gives it to Jacob. And so uh, when Esau comes and cooks and Rebekah doesn't even tell Esau uh, this has happened. So the man prepares the meal. He puts the danya, the chilies. He puts the peppers. He's cooking it. The meat is soft. Takes it with trembling and fear to his father. And the man is surprised that this man has come now and asked for the blessing. And he goes on his knees and he says, please, my father, please find one blessing for me. So here's the consequence of not seeing. If Esau and Isaac had been summoned by their father and said, boys, this is what God spoke to Abraham. This is what God spoke to me and your mother. I'm now telling you that Esau, you are a cunning hunter. You will be building an army, a defense force to defend your brother because he is the one that God is going to bring 12 tribes out of and a Messiah will come out of him. But the consequence of not seeing to possessing the promised land cost the Israelites 500 years. The consequence of not seeing cost Israel, the children of Jacob, 500 years. Slavery in Egypt. Hardship and difficulty. And, and, and not growing naturally with, with time, but having to fight wars to occupy what was rightfully theirs. The consequence of not seeing can cost you time, cost you generations. Keith and I were trying to calculate yesterday, but one, what 500 years would be. That's 12 generations, Shamori. The consequence of not seeing. And then the last one is Eli. Eli didn't see. And whether Eli couldn't see, whether it was physical eyesight, which the Bible uh, implies, I want to read into the fact that Eli couldn't see uh, because it is suggested in a commentary that when Phineas and Hophni were born, they were twins. 
And when they were born, their mother died. And uh, death in childbearing was not uncommon back then and still is a challenge now. Thank God for modern medicine and C-sections, etc. But now when she's giving birth, the boys die. So Eli has to speak to God on behalf of the people. He has to receive sacrifices. He has to interpret the law. He's a judge, so he has to judge cases, small cases, big cases. And so the boys are small, no mother. And so now he's looking up to the boys, they're crawling under his feet. And so one has an attitude, the other one also has an attitude. And so he's busy with this thing because Ned is fighting with Tanashe over some internet thing. And so it's an important thing to keep the fellowship of the saints, right? And so uh, the boys are fighting. They're throwing tomato sauce, breaking bottles, throwing tantrums. And Eli is letting them get away with small things. And, and, and now they don't have a mother. And so he doesn't see their faults. He doesn't see their problems. He doesn't see their challenges. And now that they are grown men, and they start goofing around with the women in the church and goofing around with the offerings and playing around with the sacrifices because he has chosen not to see. In the day when he truly can't see, he doesn't see that his boys have grown up into being monsters. Sisters and brothers, the consequence of not seeing can cost the nation grossly. It's going to take God to bring a Hannah who is barren on her knees sees further than Eli sitting on the throne of the high priest. And even if you are Eli, God will give you a small chance to see a, a suppling, a, a rising woman in desperation just to have a child. She wanted a child, but God could see in Hannah, this woman is not just right to be a mother. She has the credentials and the qualifications to raise up one of the greatest prophets of all time. God saw in Hannah what Hannah couldn't see and what Eli couldn't see and what uh, Elkaniah couldn't see. He, he, he saw in part because the Bible says that she was getting double portions of food. Uh, bigger. He saw potentially in part what Hannah actually had. But Hannah, sisters and brothers, she saw in Samuel that every year she would make him a new garment. She saw for years and years and years what this man would be. She saw that in Samuel, he'd be the father of the school of prophets. That he'd be the father of anointing the era of kings from Saul to David and so on. That he would begin to release the Nathans and the Gads. Oh, brothers and sisters, I pray that God would open your eyes to see wherever you are in the world. See what See what God is about to do. We sense something is happening. COVID-19 is awful. But I sense there's something happening. I'm asking God to let me see. Let me see what's happening. Show me what's going around in my world. I, I know it's there. Remove the cataracts from my eyes. Take away the dimness in the darkness. Take away the temporal uh, lack that I have in my life. And let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. I now pray for God's blessing on your life mightily, that God would increase you. The fact, sisters and brothers, the fact that he couldn't see was detrimental. Am I last, for instance, and then we're done? Numbers chapter number 20. Iowa. Numbers chapter 13 and 14. Twelve spies went into the same land. They all saw the same thing. But two were seeing and seeing. They saw the giants. They saw the wall cities. The, 12, the 10 that came back, they came back with an evil report. They saw the accident. They saw it right. They were in the place. They weren't telling a mistruth. They saw what they saw and reported it. But the two had an ability to see. Instead of seeing giants and walls, they, they saw giant grapes. <laughs> you can see a giant Goliath or you can see a giant grape to think that one grape can make a, a whole barrel of wine. And seeing entrepreneurial opportunities that are great 
instead of looking at government ministers that are standing in your way and uh, uh, oligarchs that are fighting and, and marginalizing the market and so on, uh, capitalizing on the market and marginalizing your industry. Or you can see a niche. Uh, there's a giant grape here. What can I do with this giant grape? And so Joshua and Caleb were of another spirit. And the consequence of not seeing cost Israel 40 years of hardship and funerals every day for 40 years, a consequence of not seeing. It will not be so in your life. We now come against blessings delayed and blessings denied. Ah, yes, I feel it. 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 I I remember when Sir Alex brought a young boy from Spain, David De Gea, to play for Man United. There was so much upheaval and so much uh, uh, controversy around. You know, they were saying, ah, this man is finished. You know, uh, uh, it's time for him to move on. But what Sir Alex saw in that young goalkeeper, I don't think he's played number two ever since he was appointed. And even rose to be uh, next to Casillas, the Spanish goalkeeper for the, the nation, was the, the selected number two. Because there are people who have a gift, an, an innate, inherent gift to see. And in that seeing, it creates patience. Are we together? Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, oh, please help me, God. Please help me. And so, so Barnabas saw something in Mark that Paul only saw years later. Thank God for a Barnabas. Paul could see. He had problems with seeing in the first place. He was blind on the Damascus road. And some of that there impeded him. He didn't see the value of Stephen. He didn't see the value of, of, of Mark. But had it not been for Mark, we would not have had the scripture. And these signs shall follow them that believe. That in my name you shall cast out devils. You shall speak with new tongues. In my name you shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Thank God for the book of Mark. If we had had not the book of Mark, we would not be able to. Uh, Mark eleven twenty two. You shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea. And whatsoever you say and pray, you shall have what you say and believe. Thank God for a Barnabas who could see what others couldn't see. Sisters and brothers, the consequence of not seeing is detrimental in your life. Pray with me now as we pray for God to open our eyes. Stand with me, let's pray. I can see. I can see. The rain is gone. I can see. The blessing is here. I can see the grace is here. I can see the anointing is here. 